Thank you so much, dear Lisa. What a constellation of um, superstars. Matt from uh, Google, Petra from Salesforce, Marian from Agility, Anthony from R uh, RGA. It was a phenomenal discussion. Thank you so much for this. Moving next, we have um, a focus now as part of Webit Global Impact Week, day two, economic sustainers on fintech and how fintech is defining the future. It's a really interesting discussion for me. I look very much forward to it because part of it is, uh, is also Liz Oaks from um, MasterCard. And uh, there is no better person to moderate this fireside chat but our um, dear friend, Christina Corner, Managing Editor at Cointelegraph. Welcome, and I leave you first to welcome the world and then to have this fireside chat. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Webit Global Impact Week. I am Christina Lucrezia Corner, editor in chief at Cointelegraph, biggest and oldest publication on blockchain and crypto. And I'm so happy that today I will be joined by Liz Oaks, executive vice president for market development of new payment platforms and MasterCard. Hi, Liz. How do you do today? Hi, Christina. Delighted to join you. Thank you very much. Well, Liz is a great specialist and expert in creating payment systems, secure, fast. Uh, and we will be talking today about a very exciting topic, uh, fintech defining the future. Uh, Liz, my first question, I guess, will be, uh, what is it that excites you currently in the fintech industry? Um, and why do you think this is important for defining the future of payments? So uh, thanks, Christina. I, th I think the most interesting thing I find at the moment with fintech is opening access. So empowering people to get access to some of the more complex uh, services that in the past were you know, only really available for private banking or you know, people with uh, huge uh, salaries or, or lots of money. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea that you can use an app now to access things, the idea that you can use, in some cases, quite simple services that are digitally enabled, um, it means that we can actually reach a vaster number of people who previously didn't have access to those kinds of services. And, and that's kind of a, a broad brush statement, but actually it means a lot to different people in different demographics and in different geographies. And, and that's, uh, something that I think you know we're starting to see. We're at the beginning of a path. I think we're, we're starting to see um, design-led thinking that's actually addressing the needs not just of the early adopters and the the cool digital natives and the people who understand how you know crypto works. We're actually getting real products and services to market that impact the lives of the rest of the majority, uh, and particularly. I think you know what we've seen with the pandemic is actually being able to address the needs of a demographic that previously was completely ignored or or just we weren't designing uh, largely well enough for those people and for the things that they were trying to do. That's so fascinating that uh, so big companies that are had actually have so uh, such a big access to uh, to users um, think firstly about the social impact. Um, for those who maybe do not know uh, exactly which initiatives are being implemented recently and MasterCard, uh, but I guess everyone knows what is MasterCard, but could you please uh, delve a little bit more into the latest initiatives and achievements that you're working on uh, to encourage this transformation, this um, inclusive financial system uh, development. Uh, and um, I'm also particularly interested in, um, in learning more about your recent crypto and blockchain um, initiatives. <laughs> sure, I, I, I wasn't going to start there, but uh, we, can definitely, uh, we can definitely get to that. So I, um, I lead uh, MasterCard Send, which is one of our businesses uh, within MasterCard, which enables people to, uh, to transact and actually uh, you know, make payments where they interact. So if you're using your banking app or you're using, uh, you know, uh, quite often fintechs uh, have stored wallets, uh, lots of different approaches. MasterCard Send is, is the technology that sits behind that and the network that sits behind that that enables that to function. And, and it means that you can reach over a billion 
uh, debit cards enabled all over the world. Um, so it's both domestic and cross-border. And I think that's an interesting uh, thing to, to kind of acknowledge is that MasterCard has that both that domestic reach and also cross-border acceptance, and which means for us that you can actually also you know, transact money between people in different locations. Um, so one of the things we've been doing really is, is powering that up and, and making that much more accessible to people and, and working with fintech and working with, to be honest, the entire ecosystem, whether it's governments, it's merchants, it's acquirers, it's fintechs predominantly because they want access to, to those types of services and don't necessarily have the same access to, to the payment rails that banks might have had in the past. And it depends on the country that you're in. So that's one piece of it. The jigsaw puzzle is really empowering real-time payments. So enabling people to have that access to transact very quickly. The second piece that we as a company are working on is um, the area around bill payments. So we have new uh, capability and functionality that's been developed in the last 10 years or so around um, you know, enabling requests to pay and enabling people to actually electronically receive their payments. And, and that's kind of the first step in a path to, towards changing how we transact. But I think the really exciting thing about request to pay is being able to finally get um, an invoice or a bill for something where you say, OK, hang on a second. Maybe I want to split the payment with somebody else. Maybe I want to get, I don't know, in, for my teenage kids, it's can I get my mom to pay for it instead of me? So how do I send it to my mom and get her to do that digitally? Um, it might be that you're you know, collecting money for a group of people for a charity event or something like that. So actually figuring out what is it that we're doing that's a little bit more complex and enabling that to happen. And that includes you know, approaches like buy now, pay later. It includes approaches like um, you know, deferred payments. And so there's a whole host of things in there that actually come under that sort of capsule for us of, of bill payment. And the third area I think that I find really super exciting is open banking. And open banking, I think, means different things to different people in different countries, depending on you know, what approach the country has taken with open banking. But for us, it's really that whole idea of using data in a much more um, intelligent way to enable people who previously, for example, might not have had access to credit because they simply couldn't demonstrate that they had um, enough of you know, money coming in and out of their account or they had a good steady uh, stream of transactions or activity that they could demonstrate to somebody and be credible. And for us, open banking, you know, it can enable somebody, for example, to demonstrate that they're capable of paying a mortgage. And, and this in many countries with very high rent um, has meant that, you know, the criteria that people were using and, and, and the access to that information was quite limited. So that, I think, is one of the things that will really uh, change the dynamic and that's kind of access to credit. And, and open banking is probably the mechanism, but I think access to credit, access to those services is, is a dramatic uh, game changer for us. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic, Liz. Uh, you mentioned pandemic, and it's definitely one of the topics that uh, I guess uh, through the prism of pandemic, uh, we are looking at all the sectors of economy. So you've been working with governments, central banks, regulators, uh, banks, uh, regional teams, uh, users all, all over the world. How would you evaluate the change um, because in my opinion, we are really on the edge of this historical shift uh, in terms of uh, perception of digital technologies, but also in terms of um, uh, expectance from these digital technologies. How this last year has impacted the, uh, the payments uh, industry in general and the perception of uh, payment services in particular? So I think I'd probably characterize we were in a transition from paper to uh, you know, digital or to, to applications before the pandemic began. I think the pandemic has actually just focused us very much more on um, the physical interactions in the sense that prior to lockdowns, you know, people could still go visit a branch. They could still send paper. They could still transact in the way that they transacted before. And for a lot of people, you know, they didn't really have that nudge or that incentive or that, that requirement that they had to shift their, their behavior. What has happened during the pandemic is um, that to start off with, sometimes those physical interactions were no longer possible. 
Uh, and so for people um, just daily trying to transact in the way that they had done before, previously was just not possible. So that movement then from paper to uh, to start off with for a lot of people was, uh, you know, have I got mobile banking? And so I think absolutely, you know, your point, Christina, a huge swathe of the population has had to discover how to use mobile banking or, or any kind of internet banking. And, and I think that change is almost irreversible because once people figure out that they can actually do something far more uh, efficiently or faster, you know, using a device, hopefully they, they will stick with that. I think the second part of it then has been, how do we actually get rid of the paper? And, and so sometimes we have been, uh, accused of digitizing paper processes. And that is so true. A lot of the time we've actually been uh, taking an existing business process and simplifying it or trying to make it go online. And, and actually what we needed to do was take a step back and say, what is the experience that we're trying to drive here and take a little bit of, you know, I referred to design-led thinking earlier. That's really what's powering this. What is the simplest path? What is the best experience? What's the safe answer? What's the resilient and secure answer? And so that I think for us has been demonstrated just, you know, we, we've run surveys to try to figure out, you know, 53% more of people are using banking apps than before the pandemic. You know, there's a huge demographic shift also that older people who typically are the ones who are sitting on assets, you know, actually needed to learn how to look after their financial assets and any other assets in a way that was meaningful to them. So that's what we're starting to see. Contactless then has taken off. So I think the third piece of this for me is how do you then shift this to mobile? And I think what we saw was a shift to mobile digital contactless payments. Um, and that is really, I think, a, a powering a new wave of interaction models. We've seen a, a drive towards tokenization. So much more focus on security, much more of a focus on data protection. And so as people have had to transact far more digitally, they're much more aware now of the value of their own data, their own uh, demographic data, their, all types of data, wh where they're spending, what they're doing. And they're also acutely aware of you know, scams, uh, fraud attempts, text message fraud, phishing, all sorts of things have really come to the fore, I think. And so there is a flight towards what do I know? What can I understand? Can I find somebody, whether it's in my family or my my social group that can, you know, that I trust that can show me how this works? So we've definitely seen a shift in that direction. And I think the, you know, the future is that is going to hopefully result in embedded technology. So as we move towards Web 3.0, you know, for me, the most exciting thing is how do you make payments almost disappear? You know, that, that sounds weird coming from a payments person, but um how does it become part of the actual experience that you're trying to uh, participate in? Not the, the most exciting thing that you're doing. I mean, for most of us, you know, if I, if I want to buy a house or I want to, uh, you know, go for a day out, paying for it is not really the top thing on my, oh, this is exciting list of things to do. Um, so we need to make that much more seamless, much more um, simplistic from the user's perspective. And, and hide away to a large extent the complexity that sits behind it. And I think we can, we, we're starting down that path, but I think we have still a lot of work to do. That's a great idea, making, uh, making payments disappear as a, as a separate class of action. Um, but um, it just made me uh, think about the Novax uh, manifestation here in Italy, uh, where I was really surprised to find out that apart from the no vaccination uh, slogans, uh, these people were using um, the slogans about cash. So somehow, I don't know if it's the case in other countries, but uh, no vax uh, are also against um, digital payments. Um, and... Um, uh, well, it, it was quite difficult for me to understand their logic, but I guess the biggest concern is that like cash is something that is tangible and uh, it makes you feel more, you know, in power of your own funds. Uh, while um, you never know what's happening with your money when it's somewhere there. So um, 
I guess this is an important narrative right now because, well, um, even though a lot of people are becoming more um, comfortable digital technologies, there is also a lot of uh, concern about digital technologies. So um, what, how would you defend digital payments yeah. uh, in terms of uh, security, in terms of privacy, um, and well, of course, in terms of comfort and uh, this, uh, as, as you mentioned, yep. seamless, uh, seamlessness uh, in payments. So, I mean, this is a conversation, um, certainly I've been having, uh, I've done a lot of work in the Nordics and the Nordic countries have largely moved away from cash a very long, very long time ago. Um, I, I think when you introduce change, there are also people, there are always people who are a little bit scared, a little bit apprehensive worried about you know um big brother or you know somebody's out to get them or something is happening that they don't like um but at the same time we have to acknowledge that it's very difficult to transact cross-border globally um with cash it's hard work you have to physically transport it somewhere you have to go there yourself to start off with or, or find someone else who's going to do that for you that's difficult um, so I think when I look at it, it depends really on the perspective of the individual. If they, they are very happy to manage to transact and, and live a very, I would say, almost geographically limited lifestyle uh, within the area that, they're, that they live in, then um, it, for some people that, that actually might be a fantastic outcome. And maybe they feel a sense of empowerment and control over their own um, lifestyle. And I, I think, you know, that's not something that I would really, um, I can't really argue with. I mean, that, that that's a personal choice. So I think what we're after, what we're trying to do is to create choices though for people and, and also and that sense of access. So when I talk about access, a lot of the challenges that we see now are, you know, how do governments reduce the cost base, for example, of paying out social security? How do you reduce the cost base of collecting taxes? How do you ensure that you know children get um, you know payments for educational needs? There's a whole host of things that actually need to be resolved. Where cash is not necessarily a very sensible answer. It's not efficient in terms of collecting or handling cash, and it's also inconvenient quite often for the user. And one of the issues that we're looking at very extensively is what we would describe as like a ramp on or a ramp off. So if somebody is uh, transacting in cash in their daily life, and they're very happy with that, there often comes a juncture where actually they then need to do something digitally. So they need to pay a bill maybe for their child's school. They maybe need to, um, you know, that maybe they've got a, a parking fine or they've got something, you know, where they actually need to engage with the local authorities, with state authorities, or perhaps they're just, you know, trying to buy tickets to something and it's online. Uh, at this point, I think it would be even be difficult to buy football tickets if you didn't have some kind of digital payment. So the question then for me, the challenge is more, okay, you're in a cash environment, how do we help you to actually transact? Whilst at the same time acknowledging that those people have concerns around data privacy or wanting to remain semi-anonymous or not have all of their information shared with the end user. And so we see uh, the proliferation of you know, wallets and mobile apps and fintechs who are there to intermediate that process. Um, in either direction, whether it's you know payments being made or collections being facilitated, um, and and I think that that for us is is something that we take as a you know very much as a responsibility, and and at the same time you know it, probably very few people know this but Mastercard operates um, through Vocalink the the UK ATM network, so we do actually um, manage the cash ATM. Uh, at the same time. So we, we have people on you know, all sorts of different parts of the organization with different perspectives on cash and access to cash. Um, so you know, whilst yes, we believe in digital and we believe in digital access, we acknowledge that there are people for whom they're not quite there yet, or they're not necessarily ever going to want to adopt uh, digital for everything. Um, so we have, we have to deal with the complexity of life in the way that it presents itself. 
Fantastic. I like this concept of uh, importance of choice. Uh, I can't help asking, of course, because uh, in November, actually, Mastercard uh, announced uh, announced crypto funded payment cards. Uh, so there is a new uh, balance between fiat payments versus your know, digital assets payments that you can use through your Mastercard uh, card. Um, so how do you see this uh, this new uh, developments, the new opportunity uh, developing? Uh, in the next months, years, uh, how will it contribute to financial inclusion? Because I'm, I'm personally convinced that it's definitely a very, very important step toward uh, more inclusive um, finance. And also, what other experiments do you see uh, being developed? I don't know, with NFTs, with maybe metaversal uh, payments, whatever uh, that could excite you in the nearest future, uh, thinking about new payment systems within MasterCard? So I guess uh, if, if I said we, we start by being anchored in um, in fiat and, and we've started, you know, uh, on the service that I run in, in MasterCard Send, um, you can use a MasterCard to buy crypto and then uh, where, where it's allowed. And then actually where you have used your MasterCard, you can um, cash out into, into fiat again using that card. Uh, that's something that we've developed and, and you know, actually launched some time ago. Um, and that was probably the first stage of that type of development, figuring out, okay, so how do we bridge crypto to fiat, fiat to crypto, um, and do it in a safe way that enables people to participate. And then the second stage is then looking at, okay, so how do we do clearing and settlement for crypto? And for various cryptos. So, you know, we're talking about hundreds, potentially hundreds of different coins or different approaches. Um, that is a little bit more complicated simply because there are lots of coins and, and lots of different uh, technologies involved. Um, so that's something that, you know, that, hence your announce, you referenced our announcement in November. You know, we're, we're working out, so how do we actually do that? How do we support the clearing and settlement of transactions that are not in native fiat currency where we already have settlement rails in operation with all those central banks? So now you're looking at a much more decentralized distributed uh, methodology it's a little bit it's different to the methodology we've had before and so we need to to figure that out and, and move with the times um moving forward then we have you know we're looking at cbdc stablecoin you know what are those likely to look like how do we how do we support the development of new types of of currency in whatever shape that comes in um and and absolutely i i, I do agree with you in that um i think not only financial inclusion but for me there are there are many countries in the world where um, currency is is much more volatile. Um, the, the the government might not be as um, stable or, or um, friendly as one would like if you're a citizen of that country. And and people are you know quite often have a flight towards a secure currency or a secure means of secure you know making sure that their families are safe and that they can transact. Um, so we are going to see. Uh, continued development all in various places around the world um, and a new shape of what does currency look like. Um, that's something that I think we're all on that journey. It's going to be complicated. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, personally fascinated by NFTs, um, but I also recognize that there's a, an enormous security challenge. Um, there is a, a, a massive obligation to try to figure out, you know, how do we keep an NFT secure? Um, you know, the answer to this cannot be, um, you know, cashing out to hard, secure, uh, non-connected uh, location. We have to figure out a better answer to this. So um, I think it's early days. I, I really do. I, I think, you know, I read a statistic the other day. It's, it's something like one or two percent of the population has figured out how to participate in crypto. Um, so there's a lot of money in it, but it's a very, very low percentage demographic that actually feels that they can participate. And so for me, we have a very, very long way to go before we can feel that this is something that's that, that where people have that choice and that they can actually safely and securely do that. But it's not just um, a bet that they're placing or something that they're playing with. Um, and I think for the vast majority of you know, the, the population right now, it's not necessarily, we're not there yet. 
a long way uh, ahead of us, but also exciting, as, as you mentioned. And um, I'm so happy that uh, there are so many wonderful, smart people in this industry uh, who are combining visionary experiments with actually uh, very important um, social um, sensibility uh, and mindfulness. So thank you very much, Liz, uh, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much to Webber, Global Impact Week, Dr. Plamen Rusev and all his team for bringing together uh, this visionary and, uh, and very mindful minds. Thank you so much. Have a great day.